OK, we are about to resume, and we are going to resume with Group 10, Labour Market Intelligence. I call Amendment 54 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, grouped with Amendment 55. Uh, Rachel Hamilton to move Amendment 54 and speak to both amendments in the group. Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I will be brief, as we still have a little way to go. The Commission for Land-Based Learning Review was established to provide advice on how to attract more people into land-based and aquaculture sectors by improving learning pathways. But little progress seems to have been made, but perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could expand on that. Um, my amendment seeks to support the challenges that the Commission faced when doing the review. We know that the average age of farmers is 59 and that a succession plan for the future of the sector is essential. Amendment 54 relates to the collection of data for the purposes of aiding skills development Scotland in addressing skills demands in rural areas. And I would like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for providing comments on this ahead of stage three, in which he noted potential competence issues with this amendment. However, I have a solution. As an alternative, I have lodged Amendment 55, which requires Scottish Ministers to review the agricultural labour market intelligence periodically. I believe that Amendment 55 satisfies the concerns that the Cabinet Secretary raised regarding an overlap with reserved matters. And I sought advice from the Law Society of Scotland. And they had no issues with either of these amendments or comments to make. Thank you. And I move the amendment. My name. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. I, I now call the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. Amendments 54 and 55 seek to address a gap that has been identified in labour market intelligence data in the agriculture sector. And as Rachel Hamilton has outlined, this is something that was also highlighted in the recommendations by the Commission for Land-Based Learning Review and uh, recommendations which we're currently working to address. Now, as we've outlined in our response to that review, we've committed to producing and publishing an implementation plan to consider how we would take forward those recommendations. So, while I do appreciate the intent behind these uh, amendments, I don't believe these changes are necessary. The Agriculture Retained EU Law and Data Scotland Act 2020 already makes provision, as far as, uh, as, far as it's within devolved competence to do so, for the collection and processing of data related to agricultural activity. We're, uh, we also already review and publish what data we have on agricultural labour market intelligence. So, for example, the 2020 Act provides the legal basis for the sector completing the June Agricultural Census, which already includes questions on workforce numbers and this data is then published as part of our official statistics. So given that the objectives of these amendments are already being addressed and have a suitable existing statutory basis, I would therefore ask Rachel Hamilton not to press amendments 54 and 55. Thank you. And I call on Rachel Hamilton to wind up. Press or withdraw Amendment 54. Ms Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for explaining why she's not inclined to support my amendments, but I cannot see what there is not to like. Uh, about achieving a robust platform to fill the gaps for future land-based jobs based on environment and food security and other areas where there are skill shortages. And we specifically need to fill the gaps uh, to future-proof proof agriculture. And therefore, I will press these amendments because I think they fit really nicely within the context of the Agricultural Bill. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is closed.
And the result of the vote on Amendment 54 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes 46, no 66. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 55 in the name of Rachel Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 54. Rachel Hamilton, a move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 55 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division of members who cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Okay, the result of the vote on amendment number 55 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes 46, no 65. There were no abstentions. The uh, amendment is therefore not agreed. And we uh, move on to Group 11, Food Security Statements. I call Amendment 5 in the name of Rachel Hamilton and a group of its own Rachel Hamilton to move and speak to Amendment 5. Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Amendment 5 requires the Government to... Oh. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Is that a promotion? I'm not quite sure. Um... <laughs> don't ask a question you don't know the answer to. Thank you. <laughs> the first rule of politics, presiding officer. Uh, amendment 5 requires the government to lay a statement on food security before the parliament at least every three years. This will ensure that food security remains a priority concern for the Scottish Government and a priority for the country and that Scotland's specific food security issues are identified in a transparent manner and brought to the attention of this chamber. It's a very topical issue. The UK government have just released the new um, uh, arrival of the uh, UK Food Security Index, which gives that transparency. And I think in Scotland, we also uh, need to have that transparency. And I move this amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Ariane Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Greens have some concerns with Rachel Hamilton's Amendment 5. On the one hand, requiring the Scottish Government to produce food security statements could be useful for highlighting the need for more food production in Scotland and more climate resilience. However, as pointed out by Scottish Environment Link, the term food security is often used to argue against using land for tree planting and nature restoration. And the truth is that we need both. The true food security or food sovereignty is most likely to be achieved through a mosaic of diverse food production interspersed with planting and nature-rich habitats. Many argue that that type of land-sharing approach is best for tackling the climate and nature emergencies as well. In any case, we are concerned that this amendment is a little one-sided and we could have supported it if the requirement were to produce more holistic food and environmental security statements. And I will be interested to hear the Cabinet Secretary's thoughts on this. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As Rachel Hamilton has outlined, food security is a hugely important issue, and I appreciate the cross-party interest that there's been in this. And of course, there were a number of food security-related amendments debated at stage two, as well as Amendment 5 that's being considered today. So, as a result, I believe that the draft bill has already been enhanced with the inclusion of Amendment 47 from Emma Harper, accepted at stage two. And that makes the clear link between food security and rural support plans. It demonstrates our commitment to food 
security on the one hand, while also recognising that agricultural policy alone cannot deliver food security, which is a food system and a societal-wide topic on the other. Now, following the Stage 2 debate, I am glad to have discussed the issue of food security with both Beatrice Wishart and Rachel Hamilton, who both moved amendments in that regard. And I want to thank them both for working with me on this really important matter. And I am pleased that a compromise has been found with Rachel Hamilton's Amendment 5. This is proportionate, it is effective and provides useful information, but it is not a duplication of the pre-existing reporting requirements that I had previously mentioned. So I am therefore happy to support Amendment 5 and would encourage other members to support it also. Thank you, Rachel Hamilton. To wind up, press to withdraw Amendment 5. Uh, thank you. Um, I just would like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government for support. Um, I I don't uh, agree with the comments made by Ariane Burgess um, on, th on the need for this to be uh, more holistic. We all know that humans cannot eat trees and therefore I am just pleased that the Government have um, supported this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote's now closed. And the result of the vote on amendment number five in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 103, no, eight. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And I call amendment 56 in the name of Richard Leonard, already debated with amendment 44. Richard Leonard, to move or not move? Uh, move, presiding officer. Thank you. The question is that amendment 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Uh, point of order, Claire Hawhey. Thank you, President Officer. Apologies, I was unable to connect to the platform. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Hawkey. I will make sure that vote is recorded. And the result of the vote on amendment number 56 in the name of Richard Leonard is yes 26, no 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And with that, we move on to group 12.
12, purposes of support. I call Amendment 57 in the name of Rhoda Grant, group with amendments as shown in the groupings. Rhoda Grant to uh, speak to and move Amendment uh, 57 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move Amendment 57 and speak to 167 and other amendments in the group. Amendment 57 amends a change made at stage two that allows support to be given to plants grown for energy and other non-food purposes. My amendment seeks to qualify that by ensuring non-food purposes are a by-product of food production rather than the sole purpose Excuse of me, growth. Ms Grant, there are a few too many conversations happening in the Chamber. If you do need to have a conversation, can I invite you maybe to step out of the Chamber and invite Rhoda Grant to continue? Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as I was saying, my amendment seeks to qualify that by ensuring non-food purposes are a by-product of food production rather than the sole purpose of growing the crop. In a truly circular economy, we should recycle all waste, and one way of doing that is through the production of energy from farm waste. It can be expensive to invest in the technology to do so, and therefore support should be available. However, there are real concerns about farmland, which should be used for food production, being used to replace our dependence on oil and gas. With the price of oil and gas way beyond that of food, it may become attractive to, uh, for farmers to choose non-food production on arable farmland. And we should not use public money to encourage action that could lead to food shortages. I will. Uh, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you for taking the intervention. It's just a very simple question on um, the sort of new way that farmers are looking at using agroecology, agro and that would be on land that's suitable for food production, but it also may include um, riparian tree planting or other trees. Would, would that, that be affected by your amendment? Rhoda Grant. No, because I think that's already covered in the bill and allowed for in the bill. This is really about the production of fuel on, on arable land. Amendments 6 and 7 attempt to do something similar regarding forestry, and I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for her assistance with these. these grants for, there are grants for forestry available ex, e, elsewhere, but the growth of carbon trading leads to forestry being planted on arable land, land should be, that should be used for food production. And we need to ensure that no public money is encu encourages that um, process. My amendments seek to do that. Amendment 1 simply adds the production of herbs to the list of things that can be supported by a rural sport plan. I have concerns about the Cabinet Secretary's Amendment 15 in that it removes the word edible from the description of horticulture. I look for reassurance that this does not create a loophole for energy production to become the primary purpose of farming within the rural support plan. While supportive of the aims of Amendment 59, I do not believe this bill is where the assistance to buy land should lie. It should rightly lie within the land fund, and that recently had its budget cut by the government that Ariane Burgess's party was so recently a member of. Regarding Amendment 70, I look for reassurance again that agricultural funding will not be used to pay large estates to manage their deer numbers. This is something they should be doing at their own expense. And frankly, if we're now at the stage that lairds need to be paid to manage deer numbers, we should be looking at poaching laws rather than protect their, the deer for the elite. Thank you. And I now call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 15 and other amendments in the group. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There are, of course, a number of amendments in here, and I will try to get through them uh, as quickly as I can. But I think turning to my first amendments, first of all, in relation to Amendments 17 and 15, I think we all understand the important role that our land managers have to play in reducing flood impacts across Scotland. Paragraph 15 of Schedule 1 makes reference to flood prevention schemes, but having considered this wording further, I proposed Amendment 17 to reflect the need to look beyond such schemes and to consider how flood resilience may be improved through a range of actions at a range of scales 
sales and by a range of delivery partners. So I hope that members would agree with this approach. In relation to Amendment 15, as Rhoda Grant has just highlighted, Scotland's horticulture sector provides us with high quality fresh fruit and vegetables, but horticulture isn't just edible. And I think that this bill shouldn't rule out the possibility of support in the future for other sectors within that. And following further consideration of Amendment 201 from Ariane Burgess during Stage 2, I'm concerned that referring to edible horticulture would be overly restrictive and may mistakenly give the impression that we're ruling out the possibility of support in the future for other sectors. And that's why I've lodged Amendment 15 to remove the word edible. Now, turning to other amendments that are in this group, on Amendment 57, I'm happy to provide reassurance that there is no impact on food production as there is limited land being used for these crops and there are also no current proposals to incentivise growing energy crops. However, the recognition of these as a crop under the amendment agreed at Stage 2 allows for flexibility and it can remove barriers to those farm businesses that choose to pursue opportunities in this area. So, as such, I will not be supporting this amendment and would encourage members not to. On Amendment 58, I understand that Ariane Burgess wishes to clarify that the reference to deer and game farming, which was included at Stage 2, applies to farming only and not the rearing of birds for sporting activity. However, Schedule 1 doesn't exist to set the rules of or the criteria for what are hypothetical future supports. That detail would be the job of SSI's, ensuring that there is the full scrutiny for this Parliament and its committees. There are also no plans to provide support for the rearing of birds for shooting, so I would therefore encourage members not to support Amendment 58. Turning to Amendment 59, I want more people in Scotland to have more say in and more benefit from how our land is owned, used, tenanted and managed. The bill already allows Scottish ministers to provide support to small to medium scale farmers, crofters and growers to carry out agricultural activities and produce food through sections 4 and 6 and part 2 of Schedule 1. Now, in addition to that, there are already a range of other measures and opportunities being made available. That includes the provisions in the Land Reform Scotland Bill being considered by our colleagues in the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee, which provide increased opportunities for wider land use. And we also have ongoing support to new entrants through the Land Matching Service and the Farming for New Entrants Group. And as part of my considerations of what's needed for the future, I've asked my officials to see what else can be done to enable more letting of land for generations to come. Now, we have also launched the crofting consultation uh, earlier this month, which invites views on enabling crofters to use their crofting assets as a security for a loan. So, while I welcome the intention of Amendment 59, I think given that the bill already enables the intent behind this amendment to be met, and given the current range of other activities already in motion, I would ask the Parliament not to support it, because I think that there are better mechanisms in place for that. Turning to Amendment 61, and I think the concept of edible forest gardens, which Amendment 61 to promote I think is really positive. The growing and harvesting of fruit and nut trees is however a horticultural rather than a silvicultural activity and support for horticulture is already included within part two of schedule one. Further, the bill doesn't exclude any of the types of trees that this amendment would relate to. So where these are supported would be a matter in the design of future support schemes. And for these reasons, I consider this amendment to be unnecessary. Amendment 63 creates a trigger for an EIA where a project is 50 hectares or above and will make a great number of forestry projects more expensive and unreasonably bureaucratic. Now, as I mentioned at stage two, all new planting schemes in Scotland that exceed the EIA regulatory thresholds are already subject to screening assessment. Hundreds of projects are screened under the regulations each year, but most schemes are well designed and mitigate risks to the environment before being submitted, so do not require an EIA. So I'm content that the current approach to EIA is both appropriate and proportionate. And this amendment would also only apply to grant-funded woodland, resulting in what would be a two-tier system that would adversely affect farmers and crofters. And I don't think I need to reiterate why disadvantaging Scottish farmers and other land managers against privately funded woodland investment is a bad thing. On Amendment 64, Schedule 1 already makes provision for assisting crofters as individuals and when acting jointly with others as they would do in an active grazings committee. This government is committed to crofting law reform this parliamentary term and that will make crofting regulation less onerous for active crofters and the Crofting Commission. And it will will introduce some immediate positive outcomes for crofters and their communities and enable the Commission to regulate more effectively and help encourage more active common grazings. So because of that, I would ask Arian Burgess not to press Amendment 64. 
Turning to Amendment 66, and as I said before for Amendment 19, which is very similar, I very much value the culture and traditions of farming and crofting, which are important and worth preserving, and the aim of the bills to support them now into the future, though I know not to the exclusion of improved practices. But again, as I said for that previous amendment, it's not clear what culture or traditions actually mean, and I would ask Parliament not to support Amendment 66. On Amendment 67, ministers recognise the need and importance to have education and training on local food production and business management. However, this support is already covered in Schedule 1. And this amendment also only refers to assistance in respect of a narrow range of areas and at a single level of educational attainment, and it ignores other levels. So, for example, HND or postgraduate in areas of the rural industry. And that's why I would ask the Parliament not to support Amendment 67. Now, on Amendment 68, I I absolutely agree with the importance of educating young people on agriculture and food. That's why we have provided funding in this financial year to the Royal Highland Education Trust to continue what is a really excellent programme of farm visits for school pupils and educational resources for teachers. And we also continue to fund the Education Scotland Administered Food for Thought Fund, which provides small grants to educational establishments for the purposes of food education related projects. However, the meaning of the amendment is isn't clear. Neither curriculum for excellence nor students linked to it are defined, so it's unclear who can actually be supported by this amendment. And furthermore, curriculum for excellence is not referred to or defined elsewhere in Scots education law, nor is it actually employed in all schools. It's local authorities and schools who design and deliver curriculum for excellence. They have the statutory duty to deliver education, not the Scottish Government. So if the concern is funding in the context of education, ministers already have wide powers available under the standards in Scotland Schools Act 2000 to make grants to persons who undertake or engage in activities relating to school education or propose to do so, and to pay grants under the Educational Development Research and Services Scotland Grants Regulations 1999. So that is why I would ask the Parliament not to support Amendment 68. Amendment 69, I would agree, soil health and quality are of vital importance both for our farmers and for the wider environment. But that is why the Bill already enables us to provide support for all the purposes set out here, with paragraph 13 of Schedule 1 already enabling us to provide support related to the physical, chemical and biological condition of the soil. Paragraph 15 of that schedule also enables us to provide support relating to protecting and improving soil as a vital living system. And of course, healthy soils provide key ecosystem services. So I would therefore ask Rachel Hamilton not to press her amendment. Amendment 72, while I sympathise with the aims of this amendment, I believe that this outcome is better supported by Amendment 71 in the name of Tim Eagle, which seeks to address this issue in more general terms, offering us more flexibility of support moving forward. So, as such, uh, I would ask for this amendment not to be pressed. And turning to Amendment 71, I want to thank Tim Eagle for bringing this amendment forward and working with me to ensure that farmers, crofters and land managers can access support through the agri-support framework as outlined by his amendment. Turning to Amendment 1 to amend Schedule 1 by adding herbs, this is similar to Rhoda Grant's amendment at Stage 2, so of course I am happy to support this amendment. On Amendment 60, I want to thank Rachel Hamilton for this, and I appreciate the cross-party support in this area. The Scottish Government is always supportive of innovation, which has a positive impact and is in line with our policy ambitions, particularly in the agricultural sector. And on Rhoda Grant's Amendments 6 and 7, the Scottish Government agrees, as I'm sure all members do, that we don't want to see large areas of prime arable land suitable for producing a wide range of edible crops being planted with woodlands. These amendments will allow the creation of exceptions on where woodland may be planted. By setting this out in secondary legislation, I think it gives us that opportunity to fully consider the issue and make sure that we are undertaking the appropriate consultation before we make regulations. Ariane Burgess's Amendment 62 draws further attention to the duty of Scottish ministers to have regard to sustainable forest management and, in particular, the support for new woodlands. I am sure that we can all agree that we want all new woodlands in Scotland to be of the highest quality, sustainable and to add value in as many ways as possible. On Brian Whittle's Amendment 16, the definition proposed is broad and it covers the wide range of different types of bodies that can act as anchor organisations. So I fully recognise the important role that is played by anchor organisations in our rural and island communities, and I am therefore supportive of including reference to them in the Bill. 
On Amendment 65, I agree with Ariane Burgess that the venison sector is very important for ensuring that both wild and farm venison can be utilised, and I am happy to support that amendment. And finally, on Amendment 70, the Scottish Government has been clear in its commitment to increase deer management, including its commitment in our recent Climate Change Action Policy Package to develop a national scheme which incentivises increased deer management and investment in the venison supply chain. I am therefore happy to support that amendment. Thank you. I now call Ariane Burgess to speak to Amendment 58 and other amendments in the group. Ms Burgess. Thank you. My Amendment 58 seeks to clarify the intention of an amendment secured by Tim Eagle at Stage 2. His amendment added deer and game farming to the list of agricultural activities that can be supported. I understand that Mr Eagle's intention was that this should apply to game farming, not sporting activity. This amendment would clarify that support can be provided for raising game birds for food, but not for rearing pheasants to be shot for sport. And I have already made the point that the Scottish Greens do not believe that public funds should be subsidising blood sports. My Amendment 59 would... I've actually got a lot to get through, so I'm going to keep going. My Amendment 59 would add some crucial... Uh, something crucial to the purposes of, for support. Support for small to medium scale farmers, including new entrants, to buy land for food production. Our food producers are being priced out of buying land, partly due to investors buying land for carbon offsetting. It's crucial that we keep enough land in the service of food production to maintain resilience in the face of global climate impacts. Recent research from the James Hutton Institute shows that agricultural production and the numbers of tenants is already declining. This accelerates depopulation and weakens rural communities. And until recently, there were start-up grants for young farmers and new entrants, which included up to £70,000 to be allocated to support land purchases. The Land Reform Bill will bring a Land and Communities Commissioner. Perhaps they will want to consider the best way to reduce the barrier of high land prices for new farmers. There may be other solutions needed alongside this, such as a surcharge on land buildings transaction tax for large land holdings as recommended by the Scottish Land Commission. The important thing is that we consider this now as the issue is becoming urgent. Farmers are retiring and not enough new entrants are, are taking their place. I, I, it was good to hear the Cabinet Secretary's comments on this matter and uh, I'm interested and I'm interested to learn that she is looking into the possibility of finding ways to make more land available. My Amendment 61 adds another activity to the purposes for support, the restocking of commercial trees with trees that produce edible fruits, nuts and leaves. I've met land managers who want to do this, but there's currently no support available. It's not just about creating an orchard. Support should be available to plant a mixture of trees. Support for more innovative integration of forestry and agriculture is necessary to address both biodiversity loss and climate change while preserving food production in Scotland. And we certainly can produce food from trees. Amendment 62 ensures that all support provided under Schedule 1, Part 3 for forestry must align with statutory duties in the Forestry Land Management Scotland Act 2018, including the duty on ministers to promote sustainable forestry management. My Amendment 63 would take this further and require all large forestry projects over 50 hectares to conduct an environmental impact assessment as a condition of receiving public funding. We all know that tree planting can help fight climate change, but commercial conifer plantation can also cause significant damage to the environment. The James Hutton Institute says that more carbon may be released by disturbing soils during planting than can be absor absorbed by trees over decades. And spruce plantations can self-seed in areas where they damage restored peatland, native woodlands and high nature value grasslands. Since Scottish forestry was established, they have only required one full environmental impact assessment to be carried out by private forestry firms. We need to rebalance the burdens and benefits in forestry between the private and the public sector. Large schemes are delivered by large multinational companies that can afford to pay for an EIA. In a typical year, only 30% of forestry schemes were over 50 hectares, but they accounted for almost three quarters of the land used for planting. That means that placing an environmental impact assessment requirement 
on schemes over 50 hectares would ensure that the majority of land managed for forestry is managed responsibly while affecting only minor a minority of schemes. Community Woodland Association assured me that community woodland projects are not large enough to be affected. In other sectors, it would be most unusual for major schemes to happen without EIAs. Forestry has been an anomaly for decades, but given the negative impacts it can have, it is time for that sector to bear more responsibility. I am aware of work underway to improve the guidance around the screening and scoping process, but this is conducted behind the scenes. Formal EIAs using existing legal mechanisms would improve transparency, restore public trust in forestry, and crucially, minimize environmental damage. And this will be increasingly important as more of our land is used for forestry and more public funds are used to support it. Amendment 64 would support common grazing committees to meet the new conditionality of new payment schemes. Some grazing committees manage huge areas of land and can include up to 80 individual shareholders. There are significant additional costs and effort involved in coming to agreement about how to manage land and whether to apply for new schemes. But the benefits could be substantial if grazing committees do sign up for support under Tier 2 or other new schemes that incentivize climate and nature me measures. And the Greens would like to see additional support for these, com com these committees to adopt new practices as part of a just transition. My Amendment 70 would ensure that the rural payment framework can support deer management to tackle the climate emergency. Yes. Yeah, I'm pleased the member's taking an intervention, which appears to be making good progress. Can I take her back to Amendment uh, 58, presiding officer, uh, and ask her what her uh, understanding is of what happens to game birds uh, once they've been shot as uh, part of a, a sporting activity and whether they enter the food chain or not? I am Burgess. I, I think on. Uh, I, Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm much further away in my, my, my comments at this moment, so I'm, I've moved on. Um, and where was I? And my Amendment 70 would ensure that rural payment, the rural payment framework can support... I've got quite a lot to go, go, still go through, actually. My Amendment 70 would ensure that the rural payment framework can support deer management. To tackle the climate emergency, we need to address grazing pressures from all herbivores. And, of course, deer deer can impact on farming as well as forestry. Bringing at least some funding for deer management under the rural payment umbrella will make it easier for farmers and other land managers to address overgrazing from deer and livestock together. My Amendment 65 would ensure that the rural payment framework can support the establishment of venison supply chains and infrastructure, such as deer larders, given that deer culling is necessary to rebalance ecosystems and allow trees to grow, we should not be wasting their meat when it is very nutritious, sustainable and in abundant supply. Supporting venison supply chains and shared larders, larders is an excellent way to strengthen rural communities and local food production. These amendments taken together will provide another option for farmers to diversify through deer management and venison production. The Common Ground Forum has found that farmers would like to do that if the right incentives were in place. My last amendment, 67, would add degree and graduate level courses, courses in local food production and management to the list of activities that can be supported under this bill. And I did hear the Cabinet Secretary's comments on this, but support could be directed through the Scottish Funding Council for initial period, just as the gastronomy, gastronomy course at Queen Margaret University was recently funded to meet an industry need. There is an industry need for skilled new entrants in local food production, but there is currently no degree level course available in Scotland. The course could be available at multiple locations through University of Highlands and Islands and elsewhere and cover horticultural science, business skills, for running a market garden or glass, house, uh, glass houses and product development and promotion. I encourage members to vote for the Scottish Green Amendments in this grouping to ensure support is available for more people to carry out activities in rural communities in ways that benefit all of us and our shared planet. I think I call Rachel Hamilton uh, to speak to Amendment 60 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm grateful to speak uh, to these amendments and some of the others in the group. Schedule 1 sets out the purposes of support. Amendment 60 creates an additional purpose for support to encourage agricultural and scientific innovation, and farmers and crofters should be supported to uptake 
technologies which can promote sustainable and efficient farming and food production. And I thank the Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary for indicating that they will support this amendment. Amendment 66 creates an additional purpose of support to preserve and maintain the traditions and cultural roles of farmers and crofters. And I think I made my argument quite powerfully and succinctly at the beginning of this debate. Um, so I won't uh, repeat what I had to say. Amendment 69 expen expands on an existing purpose to provide support to promote, protect or improve soil health through the effective management of soil. And similarly, I uh, brought forward an amendment at stage two, uh, which wasn't supported, but I do believe that um, soil management, soil health is absolutely integral to the future of uh, the planet and our environment. Amendment 72 assists persons who have suffered significant damage by geese. This issue was recently discussed by the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee, and I acknowledge that this amendment is covered by my colleague Tim Eagle's Amendment 71, which provides support for farmers and producers who have sustained loss and damage as a result of the reintroduction of a native species or plant or animal. Um, on a positive note, I support Amendment 64 and 65 in the name of Ariane Burgess, and I thought, presiding officer, that we were all rubbing along quite nicely today. But turning to the other amendments in this group, Ms Burgess's unfortunate vendetta against shooting interests continue through Amendment 58. The value of game shooting enabled by Scotland's game farms is brought to bear in the value of country sports, and we heard that very strongly at Cardney Estate at the SLE Moreland Conference uh, last week. And Basque have just come out with a report that states that uh, the, the gross value added uh, value to the Scottish economy is 340 million and it supports 15,000 direct and indirect jobs. Um, I, I believe Ariane Burgess and the Green Party support um, a reversal of the depopulation that's happening in Scotland, but clearly not in this sector. These figures demonstrate the value of, the se of this sector to Scotland's rural economy. So it is astonishing to see Ms Burgess fighting to exempt game farmers just because she does not agree with the premise of game shooting. The reality, presiding officer, is that the Scottish Greens' view towards shooting and wild foods is inherently contradictory. On one hand, they support the killing of deer, so much so that they want to see females shot whilst heavily pregnant and youngsters left orphaned without their mothers. And yet, they oppose the shooting of game birds, despite the fact that the management of the land associated with game bird shooting has been shown through peer-reviewed science to deliver demonstrable environmental benefits. It is utterly bizarre, presiding officer. I'll take the intervention. If you can Lord. explain to me why hinds are being shot while heavily pregnant. Uh, later. I'm, I'm rising to correct the record there for Rachel Hamilton. Uh, the changes to the deer legislation proposed do not uh, look at orphaning uh, baby deer. That is absolutely not the case. That's completely incorrect. That is not the intention of that at all. Welfare for the deer is absolute priority with all changes. What the member isn't recognising is that the number of deer in Scotland has doubled twice in the last 50 years. They are unsustainable. Managing deer is a key part of managing biodiversity, and that is a consistent thread for the Scottish Greens. Rachel Hamilton. Well, I really enjoyed that lecture from yeah. Lorna Slater, yeah. just because... Well, I think the SNP, yeah. who are the friends um, are through the, uh, the, the, the unofficial Beauty House Agreement, yeah. should go and look at the animal yeah. wear, welfare prospects and the unintended consequences of the issues of pregnant deer being shot Let's whilst fully pregnant. Let's hear the person with the microphone, Rachel Hamilton. As I said, it is utterly bizarre, the policy, and totally um, consistent, of course, with the general apathy of the Scottish Greens towards rural interests. And so I think it's also contradictory ideology um, to drive this policy making. And that is what Mrs. Bur Ms Burgess is trying to achieve through this prejudiced and ill-thought amendment. And I urge members to vote against her amendment 58. Thank you. Thank you. And I invite uh, Brian Whittle to speak to amendment 16 and other amendments in the group. Mr Whittle. 
Um, thank you, Deputy President. I will only be speaking to my own amendment, which seeks to include identification of rural anchor institutions as subsection to development strategies uh, for rural areas, and this is to tie in with future community wealth building legislation. Current research on uh, anchor institutions in rural areas is limited, but it is clear that anchor institutions in rural areas are not the same as urban areas. Uh, large pu public sector bodies, which are a typical model for an anchor institution, tend to be located in urban areas, and this amendment could help rural communities identify economically viable businesses and enterprises in the area that could serve the same function as traditionally defined anchor institutions, such as farming cooperative markets and processing facilities. Which is why I am suggesting that the phrasing is, uh, uh, includes a body or a network of bodies. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call on Finlay Carston to speak to Amendment 68 and other amendments in the group. Mr Carston. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, my amendment would see projects in relation to educational activities and learning opportunities for students linked to the Curriculum for Excellence being eligible for funding. Now, I, I can't quite understand the, the Cabinet Secretary's position because she, she will know that the purpose of Curriculum for Excellence is to help children and young people to become successful learners, confident individuals, responsible citizens and effective contributors. Now, that, that is something that is laid out quite clearly and it is one of the flagship uh, policies of this Scottish Government, so I can't quite understand why uh, we can't link uh, policies in this a piece of legislation to that well-known uh, legislation elsewhere. So developing the capabilities and attributes of the four cap uh, capacities is embedded right across learning. There are eight curriculum areas within the Curriculum for Excellence. Literacy, numeracy and health and well-being are recognised as being particularly important. And I will highlight two of the curriculum areas of significance to this bill. Learning and health and well-being ensures that children and young people develop the knowledge, understanding and skills which they need now and in the future. And technology is the application of knowledge and skills to extend human uh, capabilities and to help satisfy human needs and wants. And it has, been profound, it has a profound effect on modern society. Learning and the technologies enables children and young people to be informed, skilled, thoughtful, adaptive and uh, enterprising citizens. The technologies curriculum areas include the study of digital literacy, textile technology, technological developments in society and business, craft design, engineering, graphics and computer science, but most importantly in case of this uh, food technology. So it's important this type of activity is led not solely by classroom teachers, but in conjunction with those involved in and with experience in the agriculture and food sectors. One organisation who excels in providing learning and experience opportunities is the Royal Highland Educational Trust, Trust has already heard, and RET aims to provide the opportunity for every child in Scotland to learn about food, farming and the countryside, and to create a wider understanding of the environmental, economic and social realities of rural Scotland. In addition, with a significant allocation of public money to the agriculture and rural sector, at the, certainly I'll give way to Mark I'm very grateful to the member for taking the intervention. And isn't it right that with young people's involvement, particularly at the real level on farms, seeing how they work, all of those really difficult lessons about seasonality, years, and actually the passage of time become so much more easy to understand, and actually they better understand their place within the environment? Billy Carson. Absolutely. I really appreciate the intervention. That, that really sets out well. But there is a significant allocation of public money to the agriculture and rural sector. And every generation, we have fewer and fewer links to the farming and rural life that is critical. And the significance of agriculture and food production must be part of the curriculum. So I urge members to support my amendment. Thank you. And I call on Tim Eagle to speak to Amendment 71 and other amendments in the group. Mr Eagle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, remind members of my register of interest as an active farmer, and can I move the amendment in my name? Amendment 71 is similar to one that was put forward and debated at Stage 2, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, and her team for working with me to bring forward this new amendment today. This amendment would enable assistance to be given to farmers and others who have sustained loss or damage as a consequence of the reintroduction of a native species of plant or animal – 
or, and or the activity of a species of conservation value. It aims to take seriously the lessons learned from previous reintroductions and activity of native species. This is not about focusing on the negatives, but focusing on the positives and importance of species, whilst recognising the need for assistance to those who work the land where needed. I believe that the, uh, whilst I recognise support schemes are already in place, I believe that including both these positions on the face of the bill sends a strong message of support to Scottish farmers and landowners moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Legal. And I now uh, call on Rhoda Grant to wind up press or withdraw Amendment 57. Ms. Grant. Um, presiding officer, I have nothing really to add other than I would seek to withdraw uh, my amendment given the reassurances provided by the Cabinet Secretary that arable land would not be used for energy production. Thank you. So Rhoda Grant is seeking to withdraw Amendment 57. Does any member uh, uh, object to that? No member uh, objects. Therefore, Amendment 57 is uh, withdrawn. Uh, call Amendment 15 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, al already debated with Amendment 57. Cabinet Secretary, move formally. Moved. Question is that Amendment 15 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, we are not agreed. Um, the Parliament will have a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Craig Hoy. Apologies, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. My aunt froze. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr. Hoy. I'll ensure that vote is recorded. Point of order, Bill Kidd. The presiding officer seems to have frozen as well. Um, yes, please. I can um, advise you, you have, your vote has been recorded, Mr Kidd. Point of order, uh, Michael Mara. Apologies, presiding officer. I think my app froze. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Mara. I'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on Amendment 15 in the name of Mary Goujon is yes, um, 105, no, 7. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 58 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with Amendment 57. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 58 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division of members who cast their votes now.
and the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment 58 in the name of Ariane Burgess is yes 26, no 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 1 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 57. Uh, Rhoda Grant to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, we are all agreed. I call Amendment 59 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with Amendment 57. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 60 in the name of Rachel Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 57. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. Question is Amendment 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 6 in the name of Rhoda Grant. Already debated with Amendment 57. Rhoda Grant to move or not move? Moved. Question is Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. I call Amendment 61 in the name of Ariane Burgess. Already debated with Amendment 57. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Moved. Question is Amendment 61 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There will be a division. The members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on amendment number 61 in the name of Ariane Burgess is yes 27, no 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Call amendment 7 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with amendment 57. Rhoda Grant to move or not move? Moved. Question is amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. Um, I now call amendment 62 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with amendment 57. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Moved. Question is Amendment 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. We all are all agreed. I call Amendment 63 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with Amendment 57. Uh, Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is Amendment 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Claire Hawkey. Apologies, presiding officer. I couldn't connect to the platform. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Hawkey. I'll make sure that vote is recorded.
Okay, the result of the vote on amendment number 63 in the name of Annie Ann Burgess is yes, 26, no, 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 64 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with amendment 57. Uh, Ariane Burgess, to move or not move? Moved. Question is, amendment 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Maggie Chapman. Look, I would have voted yes. Thank you, Ms Chapman. I'll ensure that vote is recorded. And the result of the vote on Amendment 64 in the name of Annie Ann Burgess is yes, 56, no, 58. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 65 in the name of Annie Ann Burgess. Already debated with Amendment uh, 57. Annie Ann Burgess, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment, amendment 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'm going to ask for a third time. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. We're in the home straight. The adrenaline's going and my, it's affecting my hearing. So please uh, speak up. I call Amendment uh, 16 in the name of Brian Whittle. Already debated with Amendment 57. Brian Whittle to move or not move? Move, please, Deputy President Officer. Thank you. Um, question is Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 66 in the name of Rachel Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 57. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The member is not moving. Amendment 66. Uh, I call Amendment 67 in the name of Ariane Burgess. Already debated with Amendment 57. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Moved. Question is that Amendment 67 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division of members who cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment 67 in the name of Annie Ann Burgess is yes, 26, no, 89. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not uh, agreed. I call Amendment 68 in the name of Finlay Carson. Already debated with Amendment 57. Fif uh, Finlay Carson to move or not move? Move, President Officer. The question is that Amendment 68 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There will be a division of members who cast their votes now.
And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment Number 68 in the name of Finlay Carson is yes, 47, no, 68. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 69 in the name of Rachel Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 57. Rachel Hamilton, move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 69 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There will be a division of members who cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. My appointment connector would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Mara. I'll make sure that vote is recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 69 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes 45, no 67. There were no abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 70 in the name of Ariane Burgess. I already debated with amendment uh, 57. Uh, Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Moved. The question is amendment 70 be agreed. Uh, are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Okay, the result of the vote on amendment number 70 in the name of Ariane Burgess is yes 85, no 26. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 17 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with amendment uh, 57. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Question is amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their votes now.
Okay, the vote is now closed. The result of the vote on Amendment 17 in the name of Mary Goujon is yes, 87, no, 27. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment uh, 71 in the name of Tim Eagle, already debated uh, with Amendment uh, 57. Rachel Hamilton, to move or not move? Moved. question is that Amendment uh, 71 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Members, you cast the votes now. And the vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 71 in the name of Tim Eagle is yes, 108, no, 7. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore agreed. Uh, I call amendment 72 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with amendment 57. Rachel Hamilton, to move or not move? You will be pleased to know I'm not moving. Member is not moving amendment 72, and that therefore ends consideration of uh, amendments. Um, at this point, as members will be aware, uh, in the proceedings, presiding officer is required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in her view, any provision of a bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In, this, in the case of this bill, in the presiding officer's view, uh, no provision of the Agriculture and Rural Communities Scotland Bill uh, relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority majority to be passed at stage three. Uh, stage three. Uh, and before we move to the debate, I call on Marie Goujon to um, signify Crown consent for the bill. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. For the purposes of Rule 9.11 of the Standing Orders, I advise the Parliament that His Majesty, having been informed of the purport of the Agriculture and Rural Community Scotland Bill, has consented to place his prerogative and interests, insofar as they are affected by the bill, at the, disposable, at the disposal of the Parliament for the purposes of the bill. Thank you. And given that the Parliament uh, agreed to extend the period of time for proceedings uh, of amendments earlier in the day, I advise members that I will use my discretion to move decision time to 8.22. And there will be a brief pause before we move to the uh, debate. The next item of business is a debate on motion 13663 in the name of Mary Goujon on Agriculture and Rural Communities Scotland Bill at stage three. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons. 
And I call Mary Goujon to speak to and move the motion up to seven minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to open the Stage 3 debate for the Agriculture and Rural Communities Scotland Bill. And first of all, I just want to start by thanking the convener and all members of the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee. Their work and scrutiny through Stages 1 and 2, along with their support for the need of a framework approach, I think has made for a really effective piece of le legislation. And further to that, I also want to thank those other MSPs who may not sit on the committee, but who have also engaged so constructively as the Bill has progressed. And I also want to extend my particular thanks and gratitude to the Bill team who have supported me in this work for their hard work and support and their expertise and their tireless efforts on this Bill. And last but certainly not least, I probably express the most thanks to those from across Scotland who responded to the Bill's consultation. That's to the near 600 members of the public who attended events online or in person, the near 400 written responses we received, and to the dozens who gave their evidence to the committee. The many stakeholders, NFU Scotland, Scottish Environment Link, the Scottish Crofting Federation, Scottish Land and Estates and many others who have also engaged with us directly and all who have worked to get this bill into as strong as a position as it possibly can be. Now, this bill, the secondary legislation and framework of agricultural support that will stem from it affect, affect all of us. It is the foundation of how we support food production, how we will help tackle the challenges of climate change and how we will work to restore nature. And ultimately, we need this legislation and the support flowing from it to enable our farmers and crofters and the wider rural communities that they are an integral part of to thrive. The core intent of this bill is to provide for a support model, one that enables our farmers and crofters to grow more of our food more sustainably, to farm and croft with nature, and to assist in efforts to meet our nation's climate change outcomes. The powers of the bill are about realising our vision for agriculture. It is a positive vision of our nation being recognised as a global leader in sustainable and regenerative farming, and one where our producers play that essential role of contributing to our food security, of driving our rural economy, and of ensuring our world-renowned food and drink industries continue to thrive. And I think it is also really quite pertinent that we are holding this debate and having debated the amendments on Stage 3 in the same week that I am sure many of us will be visiting the Royal High Island Show, which is our country's biggest showcase of all things food, farming and rural. As I have said in this chamber before, Scotland has a proud, long-standing heritage as a farming nation, and agriculture is the cornerstone of our rural economy. The introduction of this bill last September was an important step on our journey of transformation as we transition to a new way of supporting farming into the future. And as we close stage three, it is another milestone, but it is by no means near the end of that journey. Our route map sets out broadly how we will continue to progress. And the Rural Support Plan, which I know has been a matter of some really valuable discussion both in committee and out with it, will soon take up that mantle. And I will continue to work with our farmers, crofters, land managers and stakeholder organisations as we continue this vital work and we look to deliver on our ambitions. Presiding officer, during the stage one debate, I welcomed the committee's agreement that a framework bill is appropriate to establish a long-term basis for future support schemes. The bill has to enable that multi-year transformation in support for farming and rural communities that I've spoken about. This will be a complex process and it will include a transition over time from the complex and extensive assimilated law scheme rules. But it is right that, as a government, we take the time necessary to develop the detail of our future policy with the people who are most affected by it. And this is vital to deliver on our commitment to no cliff edges for our farmers and crofters. That is why I also welcome the Committee's recognition that a framework bill will enable the support measures to be co-developed and delivered over the long term as needed and provide the necessary flexibility and adaptivity. Events over recent years have continued to show us that we need that flexibility in order to be effective in our response to any and all future geopolitical, economic, climate and nature challenges. 
That flexibility is also central in enabling our unwavering commitment to co-developing and co-designing the details of future support schemes. Now, I've been clear about my intention to be transparent both with stakeholders and with Parliament. And over the past years, I've worked closely with the sector and rural partners to develop the, proposal, the proposals that we've brought forward in the Bill, as well as what we've introduced through our, our, our route map. And throughout the Bill's passage through Parliament, I've continued to work with stakeholders and across parties to try to reach consensus and co-develop the contents of the Bill. Now, Presiding Officer, it's in that spirit that I also very much welcome the willingness of member, members across this chamber to engage constructively on amendments. I'm really grateful to those members for meeting with me to have these discussions and I'm delighted that we could reach a consensus on many of the important areas raised during stage two. Together through that collaboration we've agreed I think a number of really helpful clarifications and additions to the bill. For example with Ariane Burgess to include examples of eligibility for area-based schemes and clarifications to the rural support plan including a list of outcomes additions that further show the breadth of future co-development. Through discussions with Labour, Richard Leonard has brought forward an amendment on information about recipients of support, transparency that I'm sure would be welcomed by all. And I also welcome the collaborative work with Rhoda Grant on amendments that will help to ensure that through regulations, we do indeed have the right tree in the right place. I've worked with Beatrice Wisher to agree an amendment on a requirement for consultation before meg making regulations on CPD. And I'm also pleased that with Edward Mountain, we reached an agreement on amendments on the right of appeal and discussions with Rachel Hamilton led to an amendment on the preparation of a statement on food security in Scotland, uh, amongst other areas too. And it's due to discussions with backbenchers of my own party that we also now have further amendments on CPD, including a comprehensive amendment on the monitoring and evaluation. All of this has served to make this legislation stronger and fit for the future. And coming to a close, Presiding Officer, the Agriculture and Rural Communities Scotland Bill will provide Scotland with a flexible future framework that will support farmers and crofters to adapt to new opportunities and new challenges. I'm absolutely clear in our commitment to support farmers and crofters to produce more of our food more sustainably, while continuing to acknowledge the need for change and to make sure that agriculture continues to play its part in cutting emissions, mitigating climate change and restoring and enhancing nature and biodiversity while continuing to produce food. I'm really fortunate in this job in that I get to travel the country meeting with farmers and crofters across Scotland who are already undertaking this work um, and undertaking some really important important activities, all trying to produce food to feed our nation and doing so while reducing their impact on the climate and enhancing biodiversity. Now, as we transition to the future, I, must I, Cabinet I reiterate my commitments that we will communicate clearly, we will ensure that there is a just transition and there are no cliff edges in support, and we'll continue to develop the details of future policy with those most affected by it. That's with our farmers and crofters. And with that, presiding officer, I move that the Parliament agrees that the Agriculture and Rural Community Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you. And I now call on Rachel Hamilton. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be able to open the debate on the Agricultural Rural Communities Bill at Stage 3 on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. I'd like to thank, first of all, thank the Bills team and the committee clerks who have supported us through the Bill's passage and the relevant stakeholder groups who have provided in insights and briefings. And I won't uh, list them all, um, but I, I do send my thanks to them. I'd also like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for meeting with me and my colleagues ahead of Stage 2 and Stage 3 to discuss amendments to this Bill. Our views on the passage of the Bill will uh, be very different. Um, the Bill, I believe, presented an opportunity for the Scottish Government to deliver a brand new, shiny new support scheme centred around Scottish farmers and food producers. It was an opportunity to build a scheme co-designed with farmers and rural communities, an opportunity to provide much needed clarity and detail on future support schemes, and an opportunity to transform form the future of Scotland's food production and put food security at its heart. However, the SNP have failed to take full advantage of the opportunity to create a bespoke plan specific to Scotland's farmers 
and food producers. Farmers and crofters and rural communities have wait waited a very long time, in fact six years, to see the bill itself and the important deal detail that will support the bill. I take myself back to angry scenes outside this parliament, outside Holyrood, when farmers protested about the lack of detail from the government on their future. And we're now nearly nine months on from when this bill was first introduced, and we still don't have meaningful clarity on how farmers and food producers will be supported. As the Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary has stated repeatedly in this chamber and the committee, the Rural Support Plan will contain the key details of the support schemes. In Stage 3 proceedings earlier this afternoon, the Cabinet Secretary stated that I quote, this is as much detail that she can provide at this stage regarding the publication of this rural support plan. However, last week, the Cabinet Secretary confirmed in a written answer to me that the rural support plan will be published before Parliament breaks for recess next Thursday. I therefore wonder what significant developments or events are expected between now and next Thursday that may cause a delay in publication of that rural support plan. If the plan had been shared ahead of today's debate, we could have spent valuable time discussing and scrutinising the detail and plans that will affect farmers the most. However, we spent time debating ridiculous ideological amendments from the Green Party about the connection and their ideological obsession uh, with, with grouse shooting. But today is just another day in which the Scottish Government have failed to give farmers and food producers the details that they need. Sadly, today is another day they remain uncertain about their future, uncertain about what investments they can afford to make and uncertain about how they can continue to put food on plates up and down Scotland. Perhaps the Highland Show uh, will be a re revelation and there will be a big announcement on detail on Thursday when the First Minister goes to the QMS breakfast, but we'll have to wait and see. The Law Society note that without certainty and clarity, it is difficult to fully understand and assess their likely impacts, particularly on those operating in the sector, as I've said, further highlighting the need to balance flexibility with clarity in law, as they say. Presiding officer, as we stand here today with the bill as amended, the government have failed to get this balance right. The Scottish Conservatives put, put forward several sensible amendments at stage two and stage three to improve the bill to ensure that it can be delivered with Scottish farmers and food producers at its heart. Whilst I'm pleased that a small number of our amendments were supported by the Scottish government and were successful, I am very grateful for that. Um, but more could have been done to improve this bill. And the Scottish, government, uh, Scottish Conservatives will continue to scrutinise the Scottish Government on how this delivers for farmers. The Scottish Conservatives will be delighted to support this bill at stage three because it is a mechanism to allow farmers to be supported. And we will continue to support Scottish agriculture. But we will also, at the same time, ensure that the SNP are held to account, that they do listen to Rural Scotland. We'll continue to call for the immediate publication of a rural support plan that is meaningfully co-designed with key stakeholders, and we have been promised that. We will continue to call for a commitment to multi-annual ring fence funding to provide long-term security and certainty to farmers and food producers, and we will continue to call to understand when the rest of the £46 million will be returned to the Rural Affairs portfolio. We will continue to scrutinise the SNP to ensure that the secondary legislation delivers for rural and farming communities. The farming communities are so important to Scotland's uh, rural and local economy and we will always support them. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. And now call on Rhoda Grant. Up to five minutes, please. And thank you, presiding officer. And can I also begin by thanking all those who helped with the bill, those who give evidence written and in person, um, the Parliament's legislation team, the clerks to the committee and other parliamentary staff, all who helped through the process. And I'd also like to thank those parliamentary staff working late tonight to allow us to conclude our deliberations because they can't get home until we go home. The bill is essential to allow our primary food producers to access government support. Our food system doesn't work well. Primary producers are too far from their end customers and often don't achieve a fair return for their work. This bill has recognised fair work practices and I hope allows scope for local production and procurement. 
However, it's all dependent on the Rural Support Plan, which is a critical component of the Bill. The Bill simply allows for a plan to be produced and funded. How our farmers and crofters produce food, reach net zero and feed our nation is totally dependent on the Rural Support Plan, and we have not seen even the vaguest draft. We urge the Cabinet Secretary to produce a we urged the Cabinet Secretary to produce a draft before stage three to allow the committee to gauge whether the bill provided the correct foundations for the plan. We're still waiting and I wonder whether again we'll be left waiting until the last possible moment to see it. Finley Carson. I appreciate uh, the member giving way. Would you agree with me uh, would the member agree with me that it's a uh, completely disrespectful to this Parliament and to the committee that uh, both Rhoda Grant and I have served on, that given the time this bill has been uh, in the creation, that we might see the Rural Support Plan, which is such a key feature of this bill, being published after the, the Stage 3 uh, proceedings have finished. Grant. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. And I fear that the government um, hates scrutiny and they believe that they know best. But the simple fact is that scrutiny provides a legis better legislation and governance. And if the government can answer the concerns and provide re reassurance, if they can reassess their plans in the face of new information, if they can do all of that, then we all win. And not only do we all win, but much more importantly, we provide good governance to the people we serve. And that should be an ambition that we all hold. The presiding officer much depends on this legislation being successful. We need food security. The war in Ukraine has shown us that we are globally interdependent and we need to be more self-sufficient. That global interdependence also challenges our net zero goal. Food miles add to the creation of our carbon footprint for food, and neither do we have any way of gauging whether food we import is net zero. We know, for example, that meat produced elsewhere is intensively farmed and produces greenhouse gases, meaning that protein from meat is often frowned upon. Yet we can produce grass-fed meat that locks in carbon, and that is net zero. So why do we import meat that undermines our own ability to produce something much more nutritious that is much better for the planet? It makes no sense. We also know that smaller producers underpin our rural communities addressing depopulation, yet we reward larger producers, many of whom would be profitable without support, to a much greater extent. It makes no sense. On one hand, we look at land reform to change land, the land ownership pattern in Scotland, but on the other, we actively encourage large land, large land holdings by paying them a greater amount per hectare than we do to those providing the greatest community benefit. Again, senseless. We need the reality to meet the rhetoric. In conclusion, presiding officer, I would therefore urge the Cabinet Secretary to share a draft of the Rural Support Plan immediately. She also needs to share drafts of the many pieces of guidance and secondary legislation that flow from this bill as soon as possible. She must allow it to be scrutinised and she must listen to what those who depend upon it say. There can be no cliff edge, but this must be a start of a process that lays the foundation for agricultural support going forward, and that vision must be clearly presented. That way we underpin our agriculture sector, supporting them to provide food security while meeting our net zero and societal goals. Thank you. I now call on Ariane Burgess. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking everyone who's been working so hard to bring this Agriculture and Rural Communities Bill to fruition to enable the next steps in the agricultural reform route map to sustainable and regenerative agriculture. And I'd like to say thank you to the MSPs from other parties with whom I had constructive conversations, the Parliamentary Committee and clerks, and a big thank you to the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government Bill Team for the many discussions about amendments and the best way to achieve our shared aims. A huge thank you to, goes to the stakeholders who have been working for years to influence this bill, and this includes organisations and, individual, and individuals across the spectrum of farming, forestry, land management, conservation, nature, restoration, 
and workers' rights, and, uh, and to the Scottish Parliament's legislation team who helped to transform, transform ideas into amendments. I want to give special mention to farmers and crofters I spoke with in Parliament, during committee visits and in my region, and to the organisations with whom I worked closely who inspired or helped me draft my amendments. Land Workers Alliance, Nourish Scotland, Joe Hunt at Knock Farrell Croft, the Scottish Crofting Federation, Scottish Environment Link and their many members including notably RSPB and Trees for Life, Association of Deer Management Groups, Worker Support Centre and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. These organisations have put so much effort in because they know how crucial this bill is. It creates the framework that will shape the on-the-ground efforts to minimise climate change and restore nature, and it will support more people to live in thriving rural communities working in good green jobs, including first and foremost food production. Each party has made important contributions to the bill, including Eleanor Whittam's addition of an animal welfare objective, Brian Whistle's connection to the Good Food Nation efforts, and Colin Smith's influence on the Scottish Government, who agreed to consult with Nature Scott on, and other bodies when designing rural payment schemes. After many in-depth conversations, I was delighted to secure government support for several Scottish Green amendments, which will bring us closer to achieving the Bill's objective. The Bill now includes suggested outcomes that the Rural Support Plan should aim to achieve. These include redu reduced emissions, reduced pesticides, increased organic farming, and improved water quality. This complements the changes secured at Stage 2, which means support can be provided for protecting and improving biological soil health, which is essential for continuing to produce food and maintaining functioning living ecosystems. I have been closely championing small producers, including market gardeners, whose small plots mean they have not been eligible for support, despite the huge contributions they make to local food supply, rural jobs, carbon sequestration and nature. And my, amendments that, uh, my amendments that will provide new routes to support could be a game changer for these key workers and attract new entrants into local food production. Uh, I will follow uh, progress closely and, if necessary, periodically remind the Scottish Government to use these new powers. I'm going to keep going. Many stakeholders felt the Bill did not give enough consideration to forestry, so I was glad to secure a few improvements in this space, and it now specifies that Ministers must consider their duty to promote sustainable forestry management. It also enables support for agroforestry that brings benefits to farms and farm animals, and for nature-based businesses and nature restoration. One tall barrier to nature restoration is unsustainably high deer numbers. So I'm pleased to have added support for deer management, which is very challenging, vital work, and for infrastructure to ensure that the venison can make it onto local plates and not go to waste. Altogether, I'm proud of the improvements that the Scottish Greens and other parties have made to this bill, and I urge members to vote it into law. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to speak today for the Scottish Liberal Democrats at Stage 3 of the Agriculture and Rural Communities Scotland Bill. This is a significant piece of legislation that is needed to support those who produce food in Scotland. A lot of work has gone into getting us to this final stage of the Bill, and like others, I extend my thanks to the Bill team, the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee clerks, the convener and members, and the team at SPICE for their support throughout the committee scrutiny. My thanks also to all the organisations that provided briefings and everyone who gave evidence to the committee. I also want to thank the Cabinet Secretary for her constructive engagement over the course of the Bill. Since the UK left the EU, we have known that Scotland would need a new support system for agriculture to replace the common agricultural policy, and I am disappointed it has taken so many years to get to this point. The uncertainty has caused anxiety for farmers, crofters and land managers and across the supply chain and associated professions, from auctioneers to vets. Recent years have been challenging for the sector. Brexit has had impacts on the ability of growers to find agricultural workers, while global political instability and rising costs have also created considerable challenges. By its very nature, farming and crofting requires long-term planning and investment, which is why farmers and crofters need certainty for years ahead. Many have just been treading water, unable to commit to long-term plans, as they have waited to see the terms of this new agriculture bill, agriculture bill and rural support plan. It has also impacted new entrants to farming, 
and as I highlighted at stage one, has negatively impacted the mental health of some in the sector. Scotland can rightly be proud of its food and drink sector. Consumer confidence in what we grow is vital, and following our exit from the EU, it's important that Scotland maintains high animal welfare standards. There has been much discussion about the inclusion of a multi-annual financial framework in the Rural Support Plan. The, committee, the Cabinet Secretary argued that it is not possible to commit to in including such a framework as the Scottish Government does not have certainty over future bu budgets, but I am disappointed that my amendment this afternoon for an indicative financial framework over multi-annual years was not, uh, was not supported by the Government. Presiding Officer, as part of our scrutiny process, the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee undertook farm visits which were extremely useful in gaining a better understanding of the variety of needs across the sector. Our fact-finding visits, including to McGregor Farms in Coldstream and the SRUC Hill and Mountain Research Centre at Cree and Larrach, were particularly helpful for learning about innovation in farming practices and the importance of sharing knowledge via peer-to-peer -peer learning. Living by the seasons, farmers and crofters are very aware of the impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss. Many already innovate and make changes to increase resilience in the face of challenges like increasing severe weather events. This good practice should be fostered, nurtured and encouraged. The sector in Scotland is diverse, from small-scale producers to large farms, and over this cross-section of producer types, support is required from the Scottish Government to produce food for the nation. Co-design of support schemes is vital to avoid a one-size-fits-all approach. Support schemes must recognise the diversity of the agriculture sector and work for all farms and crofts. New entrants need to be supported and encouraged for the future success of the sector. Presiding officer, farming and crofting across Scotland and the wider supply chain contribute enormously to our rural economy and rural communities. Scotland can be proud of its agriculture sector and all that it produces. Thank you. Thank you. And we move to the open debate. And I call Elena Whittam to be followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The importance of this bill today cannot be overstated. And my thanks too go to everyone for getting us to this stage. This bill provides the much needed framework, the scaffolding actually, for the measures Scottish ministers will use to develop the critical support that farming and rural communities need in order to adapt to new opportunities and new challenges and to prosper in an ever changing world. It will be the platform for measures focused on the Scottish Government's key outcomes of high quality food production, climate mitigation and adaptation, nature restoration and wider rural development. We need to ensure our food security, protect our environment, enhance biodiversity and support and empower our rural communities to thrive. The vision for agriculture outlines the goal of transforming how the government will support farming and food production in Scotland to become a global leader in sustainable and regenerative agriculture and put farmers, crofters and land managers at its core and values their efforts to help feed the nation and steward our countryside. The Scottish Government understands that the sector needs flexibility now and into the future to best respond to the pressures and challenges that we will continue to face. And the NFUS has told us that being nimble and flexible is indeed key. As we move forward, the bill will allow for adaptive support to farmers, crofters and land managers in the near, medium and long term future, as the Scottish Government continues to co-develop the measures for the four-tiered support framework. It remains committed to supporting active farming and food production with direct payments now and will have a phased approach for integrating new conditionality. There must be no cliff edges in either support or conditionality. It is important to reflect that this bill was informed by the insight of five farmer-led groups. Um, who reported um, to us. These invaluable groups made contributions on the suckler beef, dairy, pig, arable and hill and upland and crofting sectors and demonstrated a shared commitment to and appetite for change across the industry. During consideration of the bill, many expressed that there needed to be much more detail on the face of the bill. And whilst, whilst I do understand why some felt this way, it is not practical to lay out detailed schemes in primary legislation, as this would remove the opportunity to create flexibility to respond to unforeseen future issues, which is why the framework bill is the right way forward. Secondary legislation will lay out detailed schemes, which will be within the framework for primary legislation, but will be best able to respond to change. 
It is also important that we ensure that there is space for the relevant committee to scrutinise future iterations in a way that is effective for all. And I do agree that it is imperative that we see the Rural Support Plan as soon as is possible. Presenting officer, one of the first sessions I attended as a new committee member was when we hosted 37 land managers and community representatives from across Scotland to help inform our consideration of the bill. I found this session to be highly informative and came, came away contemplating how we create space for and support to our smaller producers and how we ensure that the voice of rural communities are amplified and supported to thrive. And I would be keen to hear from the Cabinet Secretary on both of these issues when she sums up. Finally, it is important that we reflect on why this bill was needed in the first place. Brexit, a change that this country did not vote for and which has actually been quite disastrous for our rural communities. While Scotland was in the EU, we did enjoy the benefit of a seven-year multi-annual framework, which re was reflective of the uniqueness of our agricultural landscape, with Scotland receiving nearly a billion pounds in funding annually to support farming, food production, woodland creation, environmental protection and wider rural priorities. Since Brexit, Scotland's funding allocation has been on an annual basis, with no certainty beyond next year, and scant dialogue from the UK ministers, despite the best efforts of our Cabinet Secretary. And Maybe an incoming government um, can have a better dialogue. We must also recognise the threats the UK Internal Market Act places upon our agricultural sector and the difficulties it means for our ability to tailor agricultural payments to the specific needs for Scottish farmers, crofters and land managers in the future. And I don't think we can underestimate that. Presiding officer, this framework bill is needed and I urge the Parliament to support it today. Thank you. And I call Finlay Carson to be followed by Richard Leonard. Thank you, President Officer. The Agriculture and Rural Communities Scotland Bill has been a long time coming, uh, particularly given the UK vote almost eight, exactly eight years ago and over eight, three years since the UK Government passed its new Act in November 2020. This new framework bill, we are told, will be used by the Scottish Government to deliver its vision for agriculture, but I am not alone, far from it, when I say that there has been insufficient progress on in providing detail to farmers and growers across Scotland and how that vision will look like in practice. The Rural Affairs and Islands Committee handled stage one and two, and I thank the committee clerks and all the witnesses uh, that took part. But we, we, we undertook a significant piece of pre-ledge work holding scrutiny evidence sessions, gaining a broad understanding of Scottish agriculture and future challenges and opportunities. Throughout witness sessions and visits, we heard concerns from across the sector about the timing of this bill, uh, but more importantly about the lack of information about the direction of future agricultural support. Sadly, the passing of this bill will not relieve any fears around that challenge. Stakeholders also demanded that any future agriculture and, and rural support must be developed in full consultation with them. And while the Cabinet Secretary has reiterated the Government's intention to co-design the agricultural support system with stakeholders, the Bill has fallen short of providing adequate rules for statutory consultation. Now, linking, uh, index linking budgets would be a true measure of co-design at a grassroots level, but what we've got from this SNP government is, yep, the ill-thought-out calving index condition, just as one example of co-design not working. These new quali uh, qualifying conditions to be introduced uh, to the Scottish Suckler Beef Support System, uh, which is a hugely important payment system for some. It accounts for 33% of their income. But farmers and representative groups are asking for the scheme to be paused. The Institute of Auctioneers and Appraisals in Scotland has described the new conditionality measures as counterintuitive. And the National Beef Association have said that to introduce the conditions halfway through the qualifying period is just foolish. So I hope this is not an example of the co-design that the Cabinet Secretary has been portraying as the gold standard in policy making. Now, a framework bill can deliver policy which is flexible and adaptable, but nevertheless, the Law Society highlighted the need for flexibility to be appropriately balanced against ensuring there is clarity in the law with appropriate levels of parliamentary scrutiny underpinning legislative and policy development, along with meaningful stakeholder consultation. And without greater detail as to how the subsequent proposals will operate in practice, it's difficult to fully understand and assess their likely impacts, particularly on those operating in the sector. As a former NFUS president said to me with regards to the Scottish Government's bill, he said this bill effectively says, give us the power to do whatever we want, when we want, with whatever budget we want, on policy priorities as yet undecided or at least unpublished. 
Presiding officer, the publication of the draft rural support plan could have been the saving grace in addressing some of the uncertainties, but despite calls for it to be published before stage three to allow discussion and initial uh, scrutiny, those calls have been ignored by this government. All we have had is amendments which provide some more information and the commitment to effective consultation with those affected uh, by the plan uh, during the preparation or, or any subsequent reviews. But this, it, whilst welcome, falls sh well short of what the industry and stakeholders were looking for. Presiding officer, this bill could have been so much more. This was the opportunity for Scotland to move away from the cap and develop a plan and strategy, a bespoke uh, piece of legislation capable of delivering a future farming industry addressing Scotland's unique challenges and opportunities, ensuring an industry which is sustainable and profitable and capable of delivering the outcomes we all want to see in terms of food security, climate change, biodiversity and rural repopulation. I'm disappointed by the lack of ambition shown by this government and some of our farming representative organisations because their closeness to government and unquestioning acceptance of this bill is regrettable and I sincerely hope that the lack of vision does not derail what our hugely innovative farmers have already achieved in the last few years without often misguided interference from Mr. this Carson government. Is concluding. Thank you very much. And I call on Richard Leonard, final speaker in the open debate. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I draw members' attention to my voluntary register of interest? As I set out in the Stage 1 debate, the stated intentions of this bill are ones which we broadly welcome. But the test will be whether those intentions are fulfilled, which is why I, for one, welcome the Government's willingness to improve the transparency, monitoring and evaluation of the distribution of farm payments and other financial instruments. Pete Ritchie of Nourish Scotland told me just this week that the very latest figures show that the top 10% of recipients of basic payments swallowed up 43.7% of the total budget. That's over a quarter of a billion pounds going to the top 10%. And we have the largest concentration of land ownership in the whole of Western Europe. So if in a year or two's time, the biggest and wealthiest landowners are still the biggest recipients of farm support payments, then in my view, we will have failed. We also need to turn back the tide of corporate greenwashing, to turn back the tide of corporate and capital wealth tax avoidance, to turn back the tide of city spivs and speculators dominating the reforestation of Scotland. There is no meaningful regulation of this market. The Cabinet Secretary tells us that Scottish forestry does not restrict funding to companies based on their wider business interests. Well, it should. This is public money. There is a racket going on here and it is a racket that we can stop. We need to end a system in which too much public money is going into the private pockets of Scotland's already wealthy corporations and estate owners. And what a contrast all that is to the plight of the people who work on our farms, to those 67,000 farm labourers in Scotland, and to those six to 7,000 migrant seasonal workers, who are, in my view, the most exploited workers in Scotland, they are treated as the lowest of the low. Now, the landowners tell us that fair work principles should not apply to them because they are covered by the Scottish Agricultural Wages Board, but their hourly rate is just £11.44 an hour. That's well below the living wage. Add to that that they have a deduction from that, in many cases, for accommodation, which is often below a tolerable standard, which we have learned through the course of the passage of this legislation, accommodation which is not inspected at all. There is a huge inequality. There is a great injustice here, which should challenge not just our sense of fairness, but our sense of morality. So I am disappointed by the government's unimaginative, uninspired in action on this in Parliament today. Let me finish with the words of John Steinbeck, who warned in the grapes of wrath that the line between hunger and anger is a thin line. In the eyes of the people, there is a growing wrath. In the souls of the people, the grapes of wrath are filling and growing heavy, growing heavy for the vintage. The current unequal, unjust, 
rigged order is not working. It is driving a movement for change, for radical change, which is pro-people, pro-worker, pro-environment, pro-nature. And that's what we must deliver. That's what our democratic, social and moral duty is, to act to deliver that real and radical change. Thank you. And we move to winding up speeches, and I call on Ariane Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm honoured to have been part of the process of shaping the Agricultural and Rural Communities Bill, and I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and my MSP colleagues for their contributions to this debate. Once again, I want to thank the numerous farmers, crofters and other stakeholders who worked so hard to make the bill as strong as possible so it can help shape agriculture and rural land use and support rural communities. A key theme that has emerged through working on this bill is justice. Climate justice requires significant changes in agriculture and land management, which in turn requires changes to rural support and incentives. Social justice indicates that the agricultural budget should be redistributed. I'm sorry, I'm not going to take any interventions. Social justice indicates that the agricultural budget should be redistributed to support more people, particularly small-scale farms and crofts. Social justice also demands the right to food, which has implications for farming, food processing, policy and payments. Ecological justice and animal rights would point us to using public funds for public good, not for subsidising blood sports on grouse moors. To advance each of these forms of justice, to advance these to advance each of these forms of justice, a just transition is needed to support people to change practices where necessary, to start new activities where desired, and to make a good living from work that benefits people and planet in the community where they want to live. Yes, that is an extremely tall order, and it won't be achieved by this bill alone. But this bill is a key piece of the puzzle, and that's why it's so important. In my opening contribution, I spoke about the improvements made by MSPs across this chamber made to this bill, but there, and there is much to be proud of, yet there are also many areas where more progress must be made. Beyond the passage of this bill, it is imperative that we continue to push for improvements that will advance these aspects of justice through rural land management and how it is supported. I tabled amendments that aimed to help new and young farmers buy land in the face of sky-high land prices. I uh, give local communities a voice in relation to large-scale non-native tree planting, redistribute a portion of farm support so there's more for small farms and crofts and for climate and nature, curb public subsidies for driven grouse moors, ensure that rural payments help promote land reform and land access principles, and encourage employers of seasonal farm workers to provide fair work in a safe environment. On many of these points, the Cabinet Secretary has assured me that work is underway to advance these aims, which did not require inclusion in this piece of primary legislation. And I appreciate the intentions of the Scottish Government, and the Scottish Greens will follow this closely, and I look forward to seeing these aspects develop. The Scottish Greens are clear as are many stakeholders, that significant changes are needed in agriculture and land use in order to address the climate and nature crisis. And that will only happen in a socially just way if there are significant changes to the support and incentives provided through the rural budget. Indeed, the Scottish Government have said repeatedly that they will transform the way farming and food production are supported. We have not yet seen evidence of this transformation, but we are confident that this bill creates the powers and establishes the framework that will enable the necessary change, which we trust will become clear as work continues along the agricultural reform route map. This will be absolutely crucial to support farmers, crofters, growers, foresters and other members of rural communities to adapt and thrive through regenerative land management, food production and related businesses. This bill is a significant milestone on this track and the Greens strongly support it and we urge other members to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Colin Smith. President officer, it's eight years since the vote to leave the EU, four years since this parliament agreed that agriculture retained EU law and data Scotland Act. And even after this long overdue bill is passed today, too much of the future of farming will still be on hold, treading water, as Beatrice Wishart said. 
There is still no draft rural support plan. There are still no measurable targets. There is still no better distribution of support. President officer, I know you cannot dot every single I, cross every single T of a rural support scheme in primary legislation. That you need flexibility to ensure that some changes can be made when needed without revisiting that primary legislation. But this bill should have set out a clearer strategic direction, a real purpose, more ambition for that future support. It should have better recognised that our current agricultural support system is not working, that too many farmers and crofters cannot make ends meet, that more than ever conflict and war is putting our food security at risk, that despite over 80 per cent of Scotland's land being used for agriculture, we have rising food poverty, that past practice has too often damaged biodiversity, and that innovative, regenerative and nature-friendly practices are still under-supported. Presiding officer, we cannot continue with business as usual. Properly supporting our farmers and crofters is key to producing the food we eat, but changing how we provide that support is key to restoring nature, to tackling climate change, to supporting sustainable rural communities. There have been some welcome changes to the bill since it was published. During stage one, charities such as One Kind and I highlighted the failure of the bill to include a commitment in the objectives to improving animal welfare. I'm pleased this was amended at stage two. High quality food production is delivered through high animal welfare standards. It's right this is reflected in the objectives of the bill and should be reflected in the support we provide farmers and crofters. At stage two, I also brought forward amendments and proper engagement in the development of the Rural Support Plan. I am pleased the Cabinet Secretary listened to those arguments and brought forward amendments on this at stage three. But, President Officer, this bill could and it should have been better. And I have to say, part of the responsibility for the fact that it is not rests with the Scottish Greens. At stage two, Amendment after amendment I brought forward, supported, supported by Scotland's environmental groups, were voted down often by just one vote. And that one vote, I have to say, presiding officer, was the Scottish Greens voting against improvements to our environment. But now we turn our attention to the implementation of the bill. Rhoda Grant was right to emphasise the importance of the proposed rural support plan, arguably even more important than the bill itself. And several members highlighted the failure of the government to bring forward a meaningful draft plan by stage three. As Rhoda Grant said, this government hates scrutiny. They believe they know best. Both Rhoda Grant and Richard Leonard were also right to highlight the failure of the bill to set out a clear commitment to a more distributive approach to farm payments. As Rhoda Grant said, we know smaller producers underpin our rural communities addressing depopulation, yet we reward larger producers, many of whom would be profitable without support, to a much greater extent. I was also struck by the figures Richard Leonard highlighted from Nourish Scotland that showed the top 10 per cent of recipients of basic payments swallowed up 43.7 per cent of the total budget, over a quarter of a billion pounds. Too much support goes to too few, and too many are excluded from that support. This bill was a missed opportunity to address that. President officer, this bill will pass today, but much work still needs to be done to ensure food production is at the heart of our rural support scheme, but is done in a fair, sustainable way, or the government will continue to fail to deliver for Scotland's farmers and crofters and continue to fail to deliver for Scotland's environment. Thank you. And I call on Jamie Halker Johnston up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, remind members of my register of interest as a partner in a farming business and receipt of uh, farming payments, member of NFU Scotland, Scottish Land and Estates, and the Royal Highland and Agricultural Society of Scotland. Looking forward to the show this week. Uh, and as a committee, uh, an associate, a uh, substitute member of the Royal Affairs Committee that was involved uh, only slightly uh, uh, in, this, um, uh, in the progress of this bill, and a member of the Finance Committee. Um, we should have been here uh, some time ago, and this should have been sorted out a long time ago. As others have mentioned, the UK Government's Agriculture Act 2020 was passed over three and a half years ago. And as others have said, stakeholders have, throughout the process, warned over the delays and the impact of delays 
of this bill. Um, and I feel a sense of deja vu speaking today as I spoke in the stage one debate, because although the political uh, side of Scotland has uh, changed, as uh, Fergus Ewing called it, the Faustian Pact of the Butte House Agreement uh, is over, possibly in name only. Uh, many of the concerns that we had there remain today. As others have mentioned, um, this framework bill, uh, which raised concerns from MSPs, committees and stakeholders, has seen a serious lack of detail, um, with obviously more details to be filled in through the uh, secondary legislation. And of course, we still have no rural support plan. Uh, and remember, this is a plan that uh, Professor Thompson of Scotland's Rural College said needs to be front and centre. Douglas Bell of the Scotland, Scottish Tenants Farmers Association said the earlier that can come, the better. There is a real frustration among agricultural stakeholders just now that, about working in a vacuum. So a government that's produced reams and reams of independence papers no one reads has not been able to produce a rural support plan farmers need. But despite this, ministers have uh, ignored calls for it to be published. So I'll ask the Cabinet Secretary, and I'm willing to take an intervention, has she signed off the Rural Support Plan? I'm, I'm happy to take an intervention from the Cabinet Secretary if she'd like to clarify if she's signed off the Rural Support Plan. Well, that's a shame, because I think this is absolutely uh, vital and it's important. And it will, as my colleague Finn Carson said only a few, few, uh, the, few during this debate, it will be extraordinarily disrespectful if uh, the rural support plan that we've been denied seeing here and being able to scrutinise is perhaps published uh, in the next few days mm -hmm. for political reasons. Yeah. Um, that lack of detail, that uncertainty for farmers has impacted on investment, long-term decision-making, but not just on farmers, but on the supply chain as well. And that's why I welcomed uh, and was happy to support Beatrice, Mich uh, Beatrice Wishart's motion uh, which call for indicative um, multi-year funding. I'm disappointed, if not surprised, that it wasn't supported by the SNP. If I can turn to other amendments, um, the Scottish Conservatives promised to bring forward amendments to improve the bill over that process, and I congratulate my colleagues, Tim Eagle, Edward Mountain and Brian Whittle, on their successful amendments. And I also would uh, say thank you to Rachel Hamilton and Finley Carson, who I think have engaged very pos positively throughout the process of the bill. Rachel Hamilton's amendments try to ensure better scrutiny by this Parliament and committees of the Rural Support Plan and recognise the need to preserve the traditions of farmers and crofters. And I have to say that was never more evident than by some of the, uh, the, the amendments from Ariane Burgess that we saw. Um, presiding officer, in conclusion, the Scottish Conservatives support the bill because of the need for more certainty for farmers. But farmers are being asked to trust the SNP to trust a government that has cut rural budgets, siphoned off Bureau review funding, let down rural Scotland time and time again, let down time and time again, and often thought that they know best rather than listening to those that farm and manage Scotland's land. But many in our rural communities and agricultural sector don't trust the SNP. And so when the rural support plan is delivered and as secondary legislation is brought forward, the Scottish Conservatives will do all we can to ensure that it will meet the needs of our farming sector and our rural communities. Thank you. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary to wind up the debate. Uh, thanks very much, President Officer. But just to start off, I uh, have to say to Jamie Halcrow Johnson, the people have even less faith, faith in his disastrous party. Uh, and we'll soon see evidence of that in the upcoming elections. No, thank you. Um, thank you, President Officer. And I really didn't want to start off, I said no, thank you. Um, I did want to start off in a positive way, given the, the debate and the amendments that we have. And first of all, I did want to say thank you to my parliamentary colleagues for their contributions to the debate tonight, as well as for all the contributions and discussions on amendments. Because I am glad that we have been able to discuss the bill. I think largely we have had a few tetchy points, admittedly, uh, to, to discuss it in quite a constructive way. But there are, of course, various points and amendments where, that we weren't able to accept or areas we weren't able to agree to, but there were, however, many areas of consensus. But I do know that across the Chamber, I think all of us 
share that vision of a thriving agricultural sector where our farmers and crofters are continuing to produce food. They're doing that in a way that works for climate and nature and playing their critical role in thriving rural and island communities. And I believe that the legislation that we are now due to pass sets that firm foundation that will enable us to deliver that. Uh, firstly, in turning to some of the points that have been raised in the debate, and there is uh, so much to cover, I will try and get through as much as I can. I think I just want to pick up on some of the points that were raised by Richard Leonard. First of all, to thank him for for raising the cultural tone of the, the debate that we've had in the Chamber today with his lit literary references. But I think also because he has raised hugely important points. Now, I know Richard Leonard might not be content with my response to him today, but as I outlined, in terms of the issues that he's raised, this is a hugely complex area. It doesn't rest solely in my portfolio, and it's not just up to me or my responsibility uh, or within my powers to fix it. It cuts across government, it cuts across portfolios, but that's where I would hope he would take me up on my offer of a meeting with both myself and the Minister for Housing so that we can at least try and make some progress on the, as I say, the really important issues that he raises. Turning out to the Rural Support Plan, and I know that this is an area of great interest to members and many have spoken about it tonight. At stage two, I spoke on the content scrutiny and role of the Rural Support Plan. And as I highlighted to the committee, I recognise there's a lot of interest in this area, and that was reflected in the many amendments that we sought, sought stage two on how the provisions that we had in the bill could be strengthened. Now, I believe it was crucial that we didn't consider those amendments in isolation, but as a coherent whole, to ensure that the plan can be drafted, delivered and function. And I reiterate that I believe these amendments came from good faith to make this legislation more effective. Yes. Finley Carson. Can you confirm whether you have or haven't signed off the draft rural support plan? Through the Chair, convener, Cabinet Secretary. The convener of the committee might be surprised to know that the committee was sent a copy of the draft rural support plan on the 7th of June and it's on the committee's web page and it was published. So that's where I have to take serious issue with the comments and the accusations that have been thrown at me tonight that are completely unfounded. And if the member would care to do a quick Google search, he'll find it for himself. Now, as I say, I think it was really crucial that we didn't consider the amendments in isolation, but we did that as a coherent whole. And that is ultimately to ensure that we have the plan in as strong a place as possible, it's able to function now in this period of transition and well into the future. And the policies and schemes that we're co-developing with our farmers, crofters and wider stakeholders. That's why I'd committed to engaging collaboratively across all parties uh, prior to stage three and coming back with amendments that would reflect that. And that's where generally I am pleased that together I think we have been able to deliver on that commitment and we have introduced and passed a series of robust amendments covering both the rural support plan and our approach to monitoring and uh, evaluation. Now, there have been many other areas that were raised in relation to the amendments earlier today, certain things that were asked for that, unfortunately, while I agree with the basis of the amendments, I was unable to be in a position to support. And I think one of those is undoubtedly the commitments that were asked for from across the Chamber about multi-year financial frameworks and commitments to that. Now, Presiding Officer, the issue of funding and the lack of certainty with future budgets has been raised many times. But as members are well aware, Brexit means that we don't no longer have any assurance on long-term funding. We don't have any certainty that we will have any funding even beyond next year. So that's why I actually welcomed the committee's backing for the Scottish Government's long-standing call for certainty from the UK Government on future funding. Because rural Scotland cannot suffer loss of financial support as a result of Brexit and the decisions that have been made by a disastrous UK Government. Now, the Scottish Government expects the UK Government to meet its public commitment and engage in collective and meaningful discussion on future allocation for rural support. And that's where I have to raise the complete disrespect that's been shown to not just the Scottish Government, but devolved administrations across the UK have been completely ignored by the latest Deputy Secretary of State, not one response to a piece of correspondence and refusing to turn up to meetings where he would have to engage with the relevant members. This is a situation that can't continue, but again, I, I'm sure the voters will have their say when it comes to the 4th of July. Now, the Scottish Government has, of course, been clear 
and consistent in our position that we expect full replacement of EU funds to ensure there is no detriment to Scotland's finances, and we expect the UK Government to fully respect the devolution settlement in any future arrangement. And despite that uncertainty, Presiding Officer, I have been clear to the sector and in Parliament that there will be no cliff edges in support, as the Scottish Government has committed to maintaining direct payments beyond 2026 and supporting our nation's producers through a just transition. Presiding officer, and coming to a close, over the last few years, I have listened to all the feedback that we have had, both from members of all committees, stakeholders, and importantly, from our farmers and crofters, the people who are working the land, producing our food, and working for climate and nature. It is vital that we continue that work with them as we develop our future policy, and that is exactly what I intend to do. Passing the Agriculture and Rural Communities Scotland Bill to, in Parliament will be a significant milestone in reforming our agricultural and wider rural support systems, and it takes us another step further on that journey. And with that, Presiding Officer, I am therefore happy to commend this Bill to Parliament. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Agriculture and Rural Communities Scotland Bill at Stage 3. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of three Parliamentary Bureau motions. And I ask Jamie Hepburn, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions 13693 and 13694 on committee membership and 13695 on substitution on committees. Move, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Minister. The question on these motions will be put at decision time, and there are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion 13663, in the name of Mary Goujon, on Agriculture and Rural Communities Scotland Bill at Stage 3, be agreed. And as this is a motion to pass the bill at stage three, the question must be decided by division. And as members have been voting throughout the afternoon, I will allow a moment for members to refresh the voting app. I'll just remind members that today's PIN is 8533. And the question is that motion 13663, in the name of Mary Goujon, on Agriculture and Rural Communities Scotland Bill at Stage 3, be agreed, and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on motion 13663 in the name of Mary Goujon is yes, 115. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed and the Agriculture and Rural Communities Scotland Bill is passed. Thank you. And I propose to ask a single question on three parliamentary bureau motions. Does any member object? No member objects. And the final question is that motions 13693 and 13694 on committee membership and 13695 on substitution on committees in the name of Jamie Hepburn on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motions are agreed. And that concludes decision time and I close this meeting.